So today we're continuing the series, I Believe, and we are studying the Apostles' Creed. And week after week, we've been learning about what we believe, right? The Apostles' Creed was given to the believers as a statement of faith to help them, to help them not be swayed by false teachings. And so important, and that's why we as a church are going through it, so that we know as believers what we truly believe. So let's look at that creed right now. We're going to read it together like we've read it every Sunday, uh, and we're going to read it together. So if we can put it up. Ready? Let's read. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit and the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We are now in our sixth part of the series. And I very much encourage you, if you're joining us new today, your first time joining us, go back and listen to the past five messages. Because as you saw there, all that we believe, we dissected it so we truly know what God has called us to believe in. Amen. Today, I am excited to share with you about the forgiveness of sins. And the statement of believing in the forgiveness of sins, it simply means to release the debt of sin, to release. The word forgive means to send away, release, to cancel anything owed due to offense. And it's a simple concept to understand, but it's difficult to receive and release. So let's turn to our key passage. If you have your Bibles with you today, why don't you open that up, scroll on your phone, Matthew 6, 9 to 15. This is Jesus talking. He says this, This then is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For if you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sin, your Father will not forgive your sins. Jesus makes it clear that we must ask for forgiveness. We receive it. And then we release it to others. When we pray, we must pray, Lord, forgive us our debts as we have already forgiven our debtors. Friends, there's so much power when we ask, receive, and release forgiveness. And I'm fired up because I believe, I truly believe that this is a word that will set people free today. That there's freedom in this house as we release Forgiveness. Amen? Amen. So in our, in our lives, we believe in forgiveness in three ways. The first way, we believe in the forgiveness of God. The second is that we believe in the forgiveness of ourselves. And the third is that we believe in the forgiveness of others. Amen? But first, there's nothing like believing in the forgiveness of God. There's nothing in the world that's like His love. Amen? Amen? There's nothing like his mercy, nothing like his grace, the grace that he gives us freely. And with anything in life, we, we can agree that there's always a consequence when you do something wrong. There's a consequence to sin. Even in our world today, we can all agree that people deserve what's due to them. When you do something wrong, you deserve punishment. When you do something right, you deserve punishment. A reward. That's justice. We can all believe that together. And the first step to understanding the forgiveness of God is to understand that we are sinners. 
that we have a consequence to sin on us, that it's only right that we deserve punishment. Since the beginning of time, since Adam and Eve in the garden and creation, that sin, that, that, that disobedience that Adam and Eve placed to God puts sin and separation between us and the Lord. We're not worthy to enter in his presence. We're all sinners. We're all not worthy to be in communion with God. But thank God for Jesus. Somebody say that. Thank God for Jesus. Thank God for Jesus who takes the punishment of sin, who takes what I deserve, and he justifies us. He reconciles us to the Father. The sin that we so rightfully deserve to be punished for was forgiven. It was released. Through Jesus, we have forgiveness. Let's turn our Bibles, Romans 5, 6 to 8. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 1, 8 to 10 says, If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. You see, Christ paid the price for us while we were still sinners. Every offense, lying, cheating, everything, all the bad that we deserve, everything bad that we deserve, the punishment, Christ took it. He took it on that cross. He paid for it so that we can come to the Father freely. Amen? So that what separated us from God would be removed. The debt of our, the sin in our lives was released. It was released so that we're found to be worthy to enter the presence of God. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times where you invite someone to church, and this may be you today or you uh, online with us. You invite somebody to church. This is what they say to you. They say, or this is what they said to me. They say, Paul, you can go to church because you're a good person. But if I walk, as soon as I walk through those doors... I'll probably burst into flames because of what I've done. Has anybody heard that? <laughs> yep. And your friends, they don't want to come, right? They said, you don't know what I've done. You can go to church, but not me. And, and, and it takes everything. I, I just want to shake them. I want to shake them and say, <laughs> you know, God doesn't tell you to come to him so that you can be judged and punished. But he tells you to come to him so he can love you and forgive you and release his mercy and forgiveness over you. He came for sinners. And when you come to the doors of CLC, you won't be met by judgment. You'll be met with love. Amen? The religious will tell you to change first before you come to, to church. Change first. Because you're not worthy. And there are a lot of people right now who are not coming. Not coming home because they're too ashamed. You know, but God says, come as you are. He says, I love you as you are. Who you are right now, I love you as you are. You can come and I'm ready to love. I'm ready to forgive. Friends, none of us are worthy. But through Jesus, through Jesus, who came for all, we are found worthy. And it's really sad when the church starts to say, you know, starts to select who can come to church and not. It's really sad when they sit there and say, I don't know why that person's here. Mm. You know, I saw on Instagram that person, they shouldn't be here. It's really sad. When they say, ah, she's... That person, they're a gossip. They shouldn't be here. Friends, where else? 
Where else can people come and be met by the radical love of Jesus and the forgiveness than in his church? Amen? Jesus said it plainly when he was rebuking the religious. He was rebuking the Pharisees. Luke 5, 30 to 32. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. And if you're here today, I want to tell you, God loves you. He forgives you. He is faithful and just no matter what it is. There is no sin too big. Amen? There is no sin that's unforgivable. There is no mistake that where God can't come in and forgive you. So right now, if you're here or if you're watching with us, if you're waiting for that moment for you to be perfect before you come to God, I'm telling you that moment is right now. Amen? Come as you are. Come as you are right now. A lot of us as believers, we can remember. We can remember when we turn to God in our broken moments. We can remember how full of sin we were. And in those moments, we're able to turn to the Lord and he meets us. He picks us up. He turns us around. And he puts all the pieces back together to make us whole. There's power. He's ready to meet you with forgiveness. But friends, forgiveness is not just for new believers. Amen? We need forgiveness daily. I need forgiveness daily. Forgiveness doesn't just happen when we accept Jesus, but it starts with Jesus. We're all still undergoing a process of sanctification. We all are. We all still sin. We all stumble. Where we still do wrong and we need Jesus to forgive us. I still lose my temper sometimes, maybe. I still white lie here and there. You know, I still lose my patience. We all still sin. Is that it for us? Does God say, that's it? You messed up. You messed up. No, he doesn't say that at all. He still extends his forgiveness to us. Amen. No matter how many times, no matter how often you mess up, God will forgive us of all unrighteousness. It's so powerful. It's so undeserving. It's so humbling. And let me explain it to you like this. You're probably wondering why this box is, okay? So this right here, right? This is, represents our sins, okay? So we look at this box, and what happens when, when the, the word forgiveness means to release. So when we ask for forgiveness, when we accept Jesus, ask for forgiveness, what happens? God releases it. It's no longer there. It's completely gone. He doesn't hold on to it. He doesn't keep a record of it. It's completely gone. And as we walk through life and we stumble, sin may come back up right? And what does God do? We confess it, and he's faithful to forgive, and he releases it. And through life, we go through this beautiful process. We sin, we confess, he forgives. We sin, we confess, we, we forgive. And, and it seems crazy, right? It's so undeserving. It's so consistent. It's so constant. Over and over again, I'm messing up. I come to God. He forgives me. I'm messing up. I'm coming to God. He forgives me. Why does he choose to forgive? It's because of love. It doesn't make sense. But how many know love doesn't always make sense? Am I right? God's love for us is so deep. It's so wide. It's so immeasurable. Find me someone whose love is like the love of the Lord. Find me someone who pays for our sin in full and then continues to release forgiveness time and time again. That any consequence, any debt that we owe, that he continues to choose to release it. Choose to release it over and over again. 
There is none like him. In 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 7, let's read this verse. It's beautiful. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with truth. It always protects Always trust, always hopes, always perseveres. If you're an unbe- even if you're an unbeliever, you probably have heard this verse. It's, it's one of the most quoted verses in couples. They often declare it at their weddings, right? That's probably where you've heard it. They declare it at their weddings because they desire to love their spouse with the love of the Lord. Amen? They desire, they, they uh, ascribe to and commit to loving them like the love of the Lord. But friends, we aspire to love like this, but we got to remember God already loves like this. Amen? All that we hope for, all that we're trying to be, all that we want to be, He already is. He already loves you. It says love is patient. Love is kind. He loves you today like this. It's present day. It's right now in this moment. His love is perfect. It keeps no record of wrongs. That's what it says in the verse. When we ask for forgiveness, his love doesn't keep records of wrongs. So when God releases this box, he doesn't then, when you come to him, take the box and then keep a record and say, huh, you did that before. I don't know. He keeps no record. This box is gone. It's completely gone. He doesn't hold it against you. And that's so hard for us to understand. It's hard for us to receive because we keep records of wrong. Amen? In our relationships, with our spouse, sometimes we keep records. You offended me. Oh, but you did this, you did that. And sometimes in our lives, we even get identified by our record. People would tell you, you're a liar. Don't trust him. He's a cheater. Because they look at your record and they tell you who you are. That's how people love us. That's our conditional love. But friends, don't bucket God's love with people's love. They don't compare. Don't bucket a perfect love to a conditional love. When God says you're forgiven, you're forgiven. Your sins are released and there is no record of wrong. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. And remembers your sins no more. So today, if you're here, maybe you've drifted away because you're tired of saying sorry. You think God's love isn't big enough. You keep messing up. You keep on stumbling in sin. We disqualify us from even asking and confessing because we feel like God is keeping a record and is upset with us. I'm going to say to you again, don't bucket God's love with the love of people. He will forgive time and time again because he loves you like no one can love you. Amen. Amen. Once we have received it, once we've received Jesus, we can freely come and he'll freely forgive. But how do we do it? How do we confess our sins? We need to have that conversation with God. We need to come to him. We need to confess. That's what the Bible says. In 1 John 1, 9 to 10, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. So when we mess up, when we come to God, first we got to acknowledge that we're all sinners, that we have sin inside of us. We need to know that we've done wrong. That's the first step. 
We need to come to him, take inventory of our lives, and say, God, yeah, I did mess up. I am a sinner. I need you to forgive me. Then second, we confess it. We have that conversation with God, right? We talk to him about what we've done. We tell him it's a genuine process. It's an authentic conversation. It's filled with honesty because you come to the Lord and say, God, I'm sorry for this. And what happens? The Bible says that we're met with forgiveness. We're purified. God releases his mercy and it washes over us. We experience the releasing of sin and we're liberated. We're free. We're free from it. Free from all our sin. To have the Lord meet us at our lowest place. To have him take our sins and say, I forgive you. It's one of the most powerful things. It's one of the most powerful things and it will change your whole life. There's nothing like it. But again, this process, it's genuine. It's authentic. We don't just come to God and say, Lord, I've asked for forgiveness of these. I'm forgiven. We can't abuse the love of the Lord. Amen? Abusing the love of the Lord, it looks like premeditated sin. Where, you know, you would go to God, do the the sin because you know God will forgive. And we come into this place where it's, huh, okay, 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 okay. I know what the Lord is going to do. His love is perfect. So I'm going to just watch pornography, and then I'll ask for forgiveness, and I'll be washed. I'm, I know I shouldn't call my friend and gossip about this person. It feels wrong. But God's going to forgive me, so I'll just say it, and I feel good. Sometimes we come to the Lord with these thoughts, and it's, and it's, it's so, it's an abuse of love. You know, in the natural, we can sense when an apology is ingenuine, right? How many of you had someone come to you and apologize, and you're saying, You're just sorry to say sorry. Like, you don't actually mean it. You don't. Your heart is not in it to change. But yet we go to the Lord, and we think we can fool him. We think he won't notice. When we come to him and say, God, you know, we just continue to come and say, God, forgive me of this, forgive me of that but our hearts are not postured and ready to change. That's what repentance is. We come to the Lord confessing with the heart that's ready to not do again what we did. Yes, we may stumble, and his his grace is there, but we need to make sure that we're not abusing the love of the Lord. Amen? Amen? Friends, what unconfessed sin do we need to confess to God today? What is it? What is it that you need to come to the Lord in? What is it that the Holy Spirit is stirring inside of you right now and saying, yep, that's it. This is it. It's time to confess and be free to feel the love of God and be released from that sin. God gives us forgiveness. But the next thing is we need to receive it for ourselves. Amen? It's not just okay that he, he has it, but we need to receive it. And that's the next part. We must forgive ourselves. Once God releases us from our debts, it's gone. It's gone. We must view ourselves in the light of God's love. And we, we can't have negative self-talk in our lives. Yes, we were once sinners, but God made us new. Amen. The Lord released us. In the Bible, it says there's no record of wrong. Have you ever heard this? I will never forgive myself. Have you ever said that to yourself? I will never forgive myself. Maybe you've done things in your life, dark things, sins that you're just so ashamed of. You've asked God for forgiveness. He's forgiven you. You've talked to the people you've reconciled, but you say to yourself, I will never forgive myself of what I've done. 
It's pain that you've caused others. Pastor, they forgive me. They do. But I'm going to live with this forever. I'm going to live with it forever. And in those moments, it's where you choose to stay in bondage. And here's what happens, okay? God releases this box, right? He releases it. But what do we do? We hold on to it. He released it. It's gone. But we hold on to it. And what happens is, is we walk through life carrying with it everywhere we go. It becomes heavy. It's heavy. The weight of my sins is heavy. There's, I'm getting tired. I'm getting weary. My, my hands are, are taken. I can't grab on to the promises of God. I can't hold anything else. Everything I see, my sin is in the way. But friends, God already released it. We're choosing to hold this box. We go through life adapting to holding our sin. The reality is, is that forgiving ourselves, it's hard. And it's harder sometimes than forgiving others. We naturally keep record of our shortcomings, right? We want to do better. We want to give our best. We have higher expectations. And we don't extend the same love and grace to other people as we do to ourselves. There's a dialogue that's running through our heads. It says, well, you're just, you're short-tempered. Oh, there you go again. You messed up again. Wow, you keep on making mistakes. There's this dialogue that we have in our mind. But friends, we need to receive God's forgiveness. We need to receive that he has released all of our sins. We don't need to hold on to it. Christ does not condemn you, neither should you. Romans 8, 1 to 2, it says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. As hard as it is, the only way to move forward is to forget what is behind. Amen? The only way to move forward is to forget what is behind. And Paul said it this way, Philippians 3, 14, 13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, I forget my mistakes, I forget my, 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 my trials, I forget all my shortcomings, and I strain on toward to what's ahead. Amen? Friends, when you have con- confessed it, you're no longer condemned. What was in the past is now not you now. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, and the new is here. We're made new in Christ. And there's a big difference between looking new and being new. All right? Let me illustrate to you this way. Rachel and I, during COVID, like probably a lot of you, renovated our house, right? You're stuck in there all the time. Might as well like it, right? So we renovated our house, and the first thing we did is we threw on a fresh coat of paint, right? What happens is it looks new, and that's the rule. I don't know design, but I feel like that's the rule where you, you anywhere you go, throw, they say throw on a fresh coat of paint, right? Just white walls, and it's brand new, right? It looks new, but how many know it's still old? And the problems are still there. The foundation's still the same. The, all, the, all the stuff, the structurally, how it's composed is still the same. The wear and tear is still there. Friends, when God makes us new, he's not just throwing a fresh coat of paint on us. All right? He's giving you the new house. Amen? The old you is gone. You're not just improved, but it's totally gone. It's different. It doesn't look like it what did before. It's not just a fresh coat of paint, so catch this. The problems in that old house stay in the old house. The sin that you had in your old self stayed in your old self. So all the negative talk that's rooted in your old self should stay in your old self. God makes you new. Brand new. So we need to receive the forgiveness and release 
our sins. You are made new in Jesus' name. Amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am brand new. Amen. At home, say, type that in the chat. I am brand new. This is what D.L. Moody said. He said, the voice of sin is loud, but the voice of forgiveness is louder. Amen. Forgiving ourselves, it's so important because God already did it. He paid the price. So walk in freedom. Release yourself. Release yourself of all the sins. Because once you receive it, you can release it. Here's the hard part. We're going to talk now about forgiving others. Church, we believe in the forgiveness of others. It's got, it got quiet. Have you ever been around somebody who is holding unforgiveness? Everybody, yep, yep. <laughs> they can't stop thinking about it, right? It's replayed over and over in their minds. Their mind is just divided, right? They're miserable, tired. You look at them, and it's like almost like there's a shade of gray on top of them. They can't have fruitful relationships because they feel like they're going to get hurt. They can never get close. They're living an anxious life because they're just worried that something wrong will always happen to them. They have a short fuse. Something wrong happens, they blow up. They're just miserable. They become sick. There's just, there's just so many implications of somebody harboring unforgiveness. And it's like this. See, this was my sin. Now, sin's against me. Right? So what happens in the same way, we as people... We hold on. We hold on to the sins against us. When we don't release it, we carry it with us wherever we go. In our whole life, we're carrying this, carrying it around. Everything we do, every conversation we have, it's right there. We have to adapt to our life. We're not free to have anything else. And get this, even if it's small, right? Small. You might think, oh, it's just a small offense to me. But if you're harboring unforgiveness, you're carrying it with you wherever you go. And how many know, over time, this little box is going to become really annoying? And my hand is still tied to it. My grip is still on it. I'm not open to other things. Some of us, you know, just focus on the big sins against us. But maybe your spouse did something to you that caused you to get upset. Maybe your closest friend did something to you that you're kind of like, ah, whatever. Just time will heal. But you have unforgiveness in your heart. No matter how big or small, unforgiveness impacts your life. You could be sweeping it under the rug, and then one moment it all comes out. Because you've been carrying it. You've been carrying the weight for so long. Unforgiveness greatly impacts us. And it's sad that people who carry it, they miss out on what God has for them. They miss out. They're just not open. They're not free. They're holding on. They're, they're not available to be used and to see what God has for them. You can say, Pastor, you don't know what they did to me. They don't deserve my forgiveness, right? They don't deserve it. And what we do is, as a power move, we say, I'm not going to forgive them. This is a power move. I'm not going to forgive them. But what you're calling a power move is actually making you powerless. It's making you powerless. Because it's impacting your life. You're carrying the weight. You're carrying the weight. And what you're so tightly gripping has now gained a hold on you. It has, it's consumed you. It's your life. It's for our freedom. Forgiving our others is for our freedom. Jesus didn't give his life so that you can be miserable. He didn't give his life so you can walk in bondage. He wants you to have that full life. Walking in love and mercy and joy. Being free from, those hold, from holding grudges. Releasing what's owed to us. Like Christ releases what's owed to us. 
Because church, reality is, is forgiveness of others, it's really not an option. It's really not. Jesus states it clearly, in order to, for God to forgive our trespasses, we must forgive others. In our key passage, it says, Lord, forgive us our debts as we have already, have already forgiven our debtors. Matthew 6, 14 for if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. The requirement for God to forgive us is that we forgive others. And Jesus, he explains it clearly in a parable in Matthew 18 about the unmerciful servant. Some of you may know this story. We're not going to turn there, but I'll tell you about it. It's about a master who has a servant. Okay? And the servant owes the master 10,000 bags of gold. 10,000 bags of gold. He says, he, he goes and he, he wants to collect, settle the account. He goes to the master. Uh, the master goes to the servant and says, you need to pay up. The servant says, I don't have that. He begs for mercy. The master says, you need to sell your family, sell your, give me your wife, everything that you own to pay me back. It's rightfully mine. He begs, asking for mercy. And that master grants mercy. He forgives. He releases all the debt that's owed to him. Then this servant, this servant, he goes out to his fellow servant. He goes to his fellow servant, and his fellow servant owes him 100 silver coins. 100 silver coins. He says to his servant, you need to pay me now. I need that money. You need to pay me. It doesn't say this in the Bible. I'm paraphrasing, just so you know. Just so you're not shocked when you read it. But uh, he says, you need to pay me. And what happens is he goes to him and says, I don't have the money. Can you, can, please, I don't have the money. This servant throws the other servant in jail. No mercy. The master then finds out what, ha what happens. Let's turn there. Matthew 18, 32 to 35. Then the master called in the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I cancel all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly Father will treat you, each of you, unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is, so, this is why it's so important to understand the forgiveness of God. Our debts are forgiven. The darkest things, the worst pieces of ourselves were paid for. Because I am forgiven, because my debt was wiped clean, because one, I didn't deserve it, somebody showed me mercy, God chose to forgive me, is why I can choose to forgive others. C.S. Lewis put it this way, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. We need to choose to forgive. And friends, forgiveness doesn't mean agreement, okay? You don't, when you choose to forgive, it's not saying that you agree that this person did something wrong to you. Yes, they probably did something wrong and they deserve whatever, Right? It doesn't mean that you agree with what they've done. But forgiveness means that you're going to release the debt that's owed to you. That you release, you choose to release what's going to hold you in bondage. They will still be accountable to God. Right? They will still be accountable to God. But you, we choose to forgive so that we are released. Each person is accountable. But how do we do it? This is hard, right? This is hard. And that's a beautiful part of the Lord's forgiveness. It's rooted in love, right? In order to forgive others, we must extend the love of God. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. The love referenced here is the same perfect love in 1 Corinthians. Some of the offenses to us are so dark. They're so bad. Pastor, how do I forgive someone who cheated on me? How do I forgive someone who abused me? I don't have that in me. 
And I'll say to you, you're right. Your conditional love doesn't have that in you. But God's love. But God's love does. God's love can be extended through you. A love that covers a multitude of sin. It empowers us to release what is owed to us because it's perfect. And it's in its perfection that it can forgive continuously, right? The continuous nature of forgiveness. And the Bible challenges us to do this. Luke 17, 3 to 7. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. If they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. Matthew 18, 20, 21 to 22. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not, not seven times, but 77 times. Friends, we're not perfect. I know I'm not perfect. I will probably offend you or do something wrong against you. I think my wife has already forgiven me 77 times, so I don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> That's life when you live with imperfect people. Because they are imperfect, they will offend you. And hurt people hurt people. But there's a love that covers a multitude of sin that we can walk in freedom. Because there's real power in forgiving. I've heard and seen people. We've had encounters here, thank God, where people have come, received, and released forgiveness. People who've been abused, betrayed, persecuted, attacked, dark things, bad things, who through the love of God chose to release what was owed to them. And in that process, released anger, released bitterness, released resentment, and were freed from the weight of offense. Some who have never received apologies and never will, but still chose to forgive. There's power in forgiving others. And if you're not ready yet, you could be, I'm not ready yet. That's okay. I want to be sensitive to you because I know some of these traumas, some of these things are so big. Some may need counseling to process all that is going on. But I want you to know that forgiveness is here for you today. And that freedom is here As you choose to forgive, amen, Amen. that as we choose, we will be released from the weight. So I pray that the Holy Spirit will reveal to you right now if there's anyone that you need to forgive. If someone hurts you, talk to them. Release forgiveness. If you hurt somebody on the other side, talk to them. Ask for forgiveness. Don't let another day go by with unforgiveness. Choose to release the weight of holding a sin in our lives. 